you, Lord. The weapon. The weapon may be born, but it won't prosper. The darkness falls, it won't breathe Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. going to continue our series in Romans. So let's pray as we get into uh, wrapping up chapter 12 today. So God, thank you for what you're going to do in our midst today, God. And we just come before you and we ask you to move in power by your spirit. God, not just to show us things that we already agree with. That's the easy part when we study your word. It's, it's the things that God, 
we don't have aligned with your word in our lives that we really need help with. And so today, especially as we talk about loving our enemies, I pray that you would open our eyes to any shortcomings we have and where we need your spirit to lead and guide us into being the people you called us to be. And so move in power today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, listen, we want to welcome you today again. I look at the opportunity to share God's word as an incredible privilege. I look forward to it in in so many ways, but not just to share with you uh, as much God's truth because you you need to hear it, but God's been dealing with it in my life all week long and teaching me things. And so uh, that gets me excited about sharing his word is, is just passing on the things he's been teaching me as well. Last week, we jumped back into this Roman series and we were in Romans chapter 12. We were looking at really putting love into action, and we're going to really build off of that today because there's so much Paul is trying to pack into, uh, into this short section. Uh, and so we've been, we've been digging in. But listen, I told you last week, when you, we hit chapter 12, there was a shift in how uh, really Romans is, is dealing with us, and that shift is simply this. Now that we have received and understood the gospel, He's telling us what our lives should look like that if it's been touched by the gospel. So how should we live differently now that you and I have embraced the gospel? That's what he's telling us through chapter 12 to the end of this book. And so that's really what we're trying to address in this love thing. We, we looked at, I told you, we're looking in this section through a different, about 20 different uh, attributes of God's love and what his kind of love looks like. We only got through some of them last week. We're going to finish that up today. But today's is touching really on how God's kind of love responds when we're not treated fairly. You know, that's what loving our enemies is really like. And, and I think loving our enemies, sometimes we put that in a corner. But it's like any time that we feel like people are treating us unfairly, how do we respond towards that person? How many of you have ever been treated unfairly in your life? Is there anybody that hasn't? <laughs> I didn't think so, right? Like every one of us, we have... Part of our story is, is part of people not treating us fairly. And the reason why that's part of every one of our stories is because it's pretty common in life. Like you go through this life and people aren't going to be fair in how they treat you. And so that's the common part. But again, like I pointed out, our goal is, is the uncommon part is, is how does a believer respond to that? Because that doesn't look the same way as the way the world responds and when, when people don't treat you right. And so this is what Paul is going to t- talk to us about is what a, a life touched by the gospel, how that responds to people who treat us unfairly. It should make sense that it looks different because the world, when it treats you unfairly, um, it, it responds through sin and darkness, right? And so it, it looks very much like... Um, revenge, right? So like if somebody does something against you, you get even. That's what the world looks like. And yet as believers, we're not to be feeling that darkness. We're actually called to look differently. And look what Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 16. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. And so you and I, and we're called in every situation in our lives actually to shine a light on the glory of God in our lives. The gospel that's been done in our life, that work, should point people to Christ. And so how we respond matters. And even though it's difficult to live this out, it's very important that we respond in a godly way. But just as important as understanding that, I think is to back up and remember what we talked about last week. We don't do this in our own strength and our own power. We do this in the power of the Spirit. Look again at Romans 5.5. 5. It says, For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And so the key to loving the way God loves is that we experience more of his love. And as we experience more of his love, we allow that spirit to work in our lives in loving others with that kind of love. And so this just sets up the list we're going to walk through today on how God teaches us to love those who mistreat us. So let's just jump right in. It says in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Let me ask you right off the bat, what happens in traffic when someone cuts you off? What's your first response? (laughs) 
Now, if you ever ride with me in a car in traffic, you're going to experience a side of me that's still very much unredeemed. And Carrie can testify to this, that my life and driving in traffic is, uh, is very unredeemed. I, I don't use curse words, okay? So you're not going to hear that in the car. But listen, when you try to cut me off, I'm, not going, I'm doing my best not to let you in. Because I'm like, you are being not nice. You're being very selfish to me and everyone else behind me. You knew you needed to get behind me, Satan, right? <laughs> Way back there, and you're not doing it. And so I am not going to respond. Now listen, uh, I, I don't, uh, when, when somebody does you wrong like that, and you just, you don't want to respond in kindness, right? And so this is kind of my reaction. And in, in light of this, People get upset with me, and that always amazes me, that they get upset with me for doing wrong. Because <laughs> I wasn't nice and didn't let you in. Now listen, I know that's minor in light of the persecutions we can face in life, but it does paint a picture that shows us how we easily, when we're offended, we get mad at people, and we get angry at them, and we treat them not uh, in a blessing way, but more in a cursing way, right? Most of us, we... We curse people who do wrong to us. And some of us, it's, it is with words, right? I mean, those words just fly out of your mouth at people who do you wrong. Others of you, it's not the words you use, but it's the intentions of your heart. You just wish evil on them, right? Like, I just I hope that you get what you deserve, right? Like, you wish bad things upon them. That's a curse, right? To bless literally means that we ask God's favor upon a person. And to curse means we ask God not to send his favor on that person. And so when the challenge is, is that God is saying there's no mixing of cursing and blessing to happen in a believer's life. Because that's the hard part. Because listen, most of us, when, when someone cuts us off in traffic or when someone does something bad to us, our reaction is to curse, right? And, and you might see, well, that's okay. That was just my reaction. But later I'll get to blessing them. And we'll be like, well, bless their heart, God, right? And we let God interpret what that really means. Because if you're from the South, bless your heart can be a blessing or a curse. But we're just like, bless their heart, God. But listen, God says no mixing, and if there's going to be no mixing in how you, and only blessing coming out of your mouth, guess what that means? We have to be intentional. Before a situation happens, you have to ma have your mind made up that you're going to bless and not curse somebody who does you wrong. That's the only way your response can be blessing because in the world, in the natural, guess what? Your response is going to be to curse somebody, to, to wish them bad for doing you bad. Now listen, that means today when I'm on the highway and we're going to uh, a pool party this afternoon and someone tries to cut me off, um, then if I'm going to practice this, I'm going to have to say, God, bless their heart and let him interpret what I really mean. <laughs> and if I do that, guess what? Carrie will be very happy with my driving skills. <laughs> so may the Lord redeem my driving today and all the days of my life, really. <laughs> Let, let's just take this a step further because some, some of you may be more passive aggressive than just aggressive in your cursing, okay? And so you won't go up and get in someone's face, but listen, you will do what? You will go tell everyone around you how all the bad that this person's done in your life and you will curse them to everyone else, right? That's still a cursing in, in really how we respond. And so we're not doing this really well in our lives in so many cases. Sometimes it just creeps in and we don't even realize. And this is kind of where I want to get. I don't want to get, it's easy to be like, oh, well, when somebody does something and persecutes us, but they're, they, these seeds, they pop up in the little things. And so when you've studied hard from a test and you know like your friend didn't study for that test and they get a better grade than you, like you're angry, right? You wish that well, what? That's unfair. And, and so you feel that, right? When we're doing things like, um, listen, when somebody kind of um, is, is like dating somebody and, and you've seen that, I had a friend who was dating like this, th this girl and she was great and then he was cheating on her behind her back and then he ends up like marrying before you marry and you like watch his whole life and how he treated women you're like that's not fair right like how does that work god or or really we just have these moments when when we really just we don't want to wish good on people and so we don't want to ask their favor upon them 
Now, Paul says this. He says, he wants us to be sure that we understand why we're supposed to be wanting to wish their good. We, we are told this in verse 17. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And so right out of the gate, God tells us to do what's not normal. What's not easy for us to do is it's not easy to wish somebody good. It's easy to curse those who curse us. And that's what really good and even looks like, right? It's when somebody does bad to you, you do bad to them. And the only way we could really love people who do us wrong is that we have been touched by the Spirit of God in our lives and His love is shining through us. And so Paul goes on to say in verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Now, I love this verse, but kind of as we're studying it in context, it shows us that we take this verse out of context so often when we quote it, right? We, we quote this one at, at funerals all the time. Well, people are mourning around us. We need to mourn with them and feel bad with them. And there is an element of that. But remember what this context is. Paul is teaching us how we respond to those who harm us. Now this is a little bit more difficult and it makes sense, Right? Because when one of your enemies or somebody who has mistreated you is experiencing something good in their lives, you don't really want to rejoice with them, right? And when somebody is really mourning over something bad in their lives and you don't like that person, you kind of feel good about it, right? Like they're finally getting what they deserve. And this is the context of what Paul is saying. Now, listen, I have this problem too in my life <laughs> and it pops up in many different ways. And one of the areas that pops up is in the area of sports. <laughs> okay, there are certain teams in sports I really, really hate. And in football, it's the Cowboys, okay? And part of that I think is rooted in when I moved to Texas. Um, I moved to Texas, you know, um, Cowboys, and they, they always said this, we're America's team. And I'm like, I'm American, they're not my team. <laughs> Who, who makes them, who gives them the right to declare that they're America's team? And so I just, I really despise the Cowboys. So because I have this hatred towards them, when the Bears would win on a Sunday and the Cowboys would lose, I was on cloud nine and rejoicing. Oh, it made me feel so good on those days. Now listen, there's, there's another team I really hate, and it's in baseball, and it's the Cubs. And, which is why I'm wearing this <laughs> today. Now listen, there is a reason for this, and I want to explain it for a minute, because, because I really need you to let me off the hook for a little bit, those of you who are Cubs fans. I, I didn't always have this. I didn't always live with this hatred towards the Cubs. I was actually quite indifferent for the Cubs most of my life. And the reason why is because we're not even in the same division. So really, what the Cubs do and what the Sox do, it doesn't even matter. So I was just indifferent. I don't care, you know? I mean, someday, and it's so hypothetical, will, will there be a Cubs-Sox World Series in that day? You know, but that's never going to happen probably, right? So if, if that ever happens, that's something else. But listen, here's what changed. In 2015, when the White Sox won the World Series, the majority of my Cubs fans, not all, I had to point this out because in first service I offended somebody, the majority of my Cubs fans were complete idiots, and they were mean and vicious and, and nasty about it. And so this developed my hatred towards the Cubs. And so now when the Cubs lose and the White Sox win, I am just elated. <laughs> and I know that's bad. God needs to redeem me on that too, right? I, I know I'm sick. <laughs> I need help. But listen, what I'm trying to get you to see is how, how this is really played out. That's not super serious, but this plays out in our lives, right? When somebody does something that wrongs us and then something good happens, there is something inside of us that doesn't rejoice when they rejoice. There is something inside of us that doesn't weep when they weep. And so this is not easily applied like we make it. Like there are many instances in our lives when we just don't experience this. And so we, we really have to recognize that there are times that God is bringing something in our lives. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Most of us remember that story. And the, the part of the story we remember is the son coming to the father and saying, give me my inheritance. In other words, he's basically saying, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. And so it was so insulting, and yet the father obliged him, gave him his money. He took off and he went into a bunch of wild living, right? He wasted and squandered all of that money. And one day he wakes up and he's in the gutter and he thinks, you know what? 
my life is miserable. At home, at least my father's servants get treated better than I am being treated right now. So maybe I'm going to go home and I'll just beg my father to make me a servant. And he runs home and, and instead the father embraces him and restores him back into being a son and then throws this huge party for him. And it's such a beautiful story. But, you know, so often we miss what's going on. There's another son in the story. You realize it? And he's on the outside. And he knows the party's going on. And he is not happy. And he's not coming in to join that party. He's not going to rejoice with those that are rejoicing. He is wishing the worst on his brother. And listen, what I think we need to realize is, is some of us, we look at that story, we're like, I've never been a prodigal. And I think there are some people you, you can relate to the prodigal, but there are many Christians that you can't relate to the prodigal, but you're the older son and you're miserable when other people are happy. And, and so what you don't realize is that, guess what? You're just as bad as the son who didn't come home as you're, you're in that spot, right? Where you're miserable, just as miserable as he is when he didn't come home and you're refusing now to come into the house yourself. And that's what is at stake when we don't rejoice with those who rejoice. Listen, one of the reasons we need to do this as believers is because we understand that there's no such thing as chance. That when goodness happens to a person, it's because God has ordained that goodness to happen to that person. You know, if we really believe that God is the one moving in this person's life, that means this, to resent the good that they're experiencing experiencing actually means that we resent God because every good and perfect gift comes from God and he's the one that's poured it out to them and so if we actually do not have the ability to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and weeping with those who weep we're resenting the work of God in that person's life and that's very serious I think but sometimes we have to step back and see that God is using this in a greater purpose and listen if we step into then rejoicing with those who rejoice you might realize that you actually are part of God bringing this person to salvation through just rejoicing with somebody and they're going well yeah I know it wasn't fair that I got this why are you happy for me and remember it's a sincere love not a hypocritical not fake love it's a sincere love and you genuinely are happy for this person they're going to be wondering how and why and it's going to point to the glory of God listen even though sometimes people will experience the painful experiences that are a result and a consequence of their choices we're not to rejoice over what they're going through we are not to be happy that they're facing their consequences. Why? Because we remember this. I didn't get what I deserved, right? And if I didn't get what I deserved, our hearts should be broken when people are facing the consequences of their sin. And that brokenness should literally drive us to pray that that person that is our enemy will wake up and understand the forgiveness and love and grace that God has for them. That should be the heart of a believer. This is why it's so critical that we're willing to weep with those who weep when they're going through, even our enemies, the tough times of their life. Verse 16 goes on to say, live in harmony with one another and do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position and do not be conceited. I think in some ways what Paul's saying here is easily interpreted, but I actually think in James, we, we see it spelled out in a clearer way. In James in chapter 2, uh, he's writing to the church and, and basically they were elevating those who were rich over those who were poor. And so he says this in verses 3 through 4 of James chapter 2. He says, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among your, yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, Really, that's what you get in the world, right? You get people looking and going, hey, you're rich, you're smart, you have this. You know, maybe that'll rub off on me if I hang around you. And so we elevate those who have what we think we want. And we avoid those who don't have anything to give to us. And God basically says, hey, this should not be happening in the church. And the reason it shouldn't be happening in the church is because we again go back to the gospel message of our lives, that we have been not treated the way we deserved. God never treated us the way we deserved. And so we would be condemned 
if we didn't receive the grace the grace in God. So we don't treat others even though we might think that they don't deserve to be treated highly. In other words, we start in our low position. We start with the realization that I'm at the cross just as you are at the cross. And really and truly, our high position only comes based on what the blood of Jesus has done in our lives. And so we desire the blood of Jesus to be applied in the lives of those around us. And so we are only who we are through that. And that plays, makes everyone on the same playing field. And this is what we have to remember as we go through this. And so there's a constant humility, a constant going back to the gospel message and how it's touched my life. And then he goes on to say in verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice, first of all, he's like, strive to live at peace with everyone if it's possible. In other words, there are times when it's not possible. Well, let me be really clear. The reason it's not possible is really not because you said it's not possible. Because <laughs> some of us are just like, well, I give up and I want to try to have peace with this person and we're the ones that are calling it quits. It's not possible because the other person deems it's not possible. And it takes two people to have peace, right? And if one person refuses to strive for peace, then peace can't happen. But it is important to us to understand that we're to always be striving to bring peace. I think it's important because the whole passage is really about us as believers pursuing relationships with the most difficult people in our lives. It's not that we look for ways out to have reasons not to love people. It's that we love despite the wickedness and the evil and the wrong that they do. Because really, that is what Jesus did, right? Jesus didn't avoid us. He could have written us off and been like, hey, look at all those people. They don't like me. They don't care about me. I'm just going to let them rot and burn and let, let it take its course. But instead, what did Jesus do? He came to where we were and met us in our mess. And again, Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus comes and demonstrates his love for us while we were away from him. And really, he makes that first move. They don't make, we don't make that first move to God. And then he sends every one of his disciples to be extending the peace of God to those around them to trying to help people realize this and experience God's love. And the reason is, is that there's a day coming when peace with God is no longer an option. Like, this is a time period right now when peace with God is possible for people to come to. What is God's final judgment to those who reject him? It's depart from me, right? And when he says depart from me, then we go to the lake of fire and there is no chance for peace with God after that. But until that day, God is striving to bring peace into the lives of every person that exists. And guess what? You and I are supposed to be trying to bring people to the peace of God every option and every chance that we get. Now there's one important area where we can't live in peace with people. And it really is when it comes to compromising the truth. We simply can't. We're never called to compromise the truth. We talked about last week, that's not really love if you lie to people, right? So we can't compromise the truth. And Jesus is really our example. He's the Prince of Peace, right? And yet he says this in Matthew 10, 34 through 36, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Listen, what Jesus is saying here is he's simply acknowledging this. When those of us come to understand the truth of God and we embrace that truth in our lives, it's going to cause some people to no longer like us anymore. It's going to divide us from those people that are even closest to us because they don't want anything to do with the truth. Have you ever noticed that people get mad when you stand for the truth? I mean, you make a stand for the truth and it's not like people just leave you alone, right? You would think like, okay, you believe what you want and I'm gonna believe what I want and, and we can all live in harmony. But that is not what we even see even close to happening in our culture. 
Instead, what do we see the culture trying to do? It's trying to demand that people in the church let go of the truth that they believe in and, and deny God. And we can, we'll never have peace with those people. We can't. Because if, in order to do that, we have to deny the truth that God has declared. Yet generally speaking, guess what? We're, just, we're to strive to be peacemakers. But there's always going to be those troublemakers that we could never have peace with. And so it's really encouraging that, in a way, God gives us an out here, that we're to strive to be at peace with everyone if, if it's at all possible. Just remember, that possibility has to do with the other person who isn't willing to have peace with us. We don't give up on the world because they don't want to have peace. And then it goes on to say, verse 19, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. And finally, we are to live our lives not by seeking revenge. And there's a, there's a good reason for this. It's, it's really the impact that revenge has on our lives when we seek it. Let me give you a couple things. Revenge puts us really, first of all, in the judgment seat. And we're not very good judges, okay? I mean, think about this. We don't really know everything that's going on in a situation. And so we judge those things and often we're wrong. On top of that, we don't judge based on what really is the reality of things. Our world distorts reality. And so often uh, that distortion of reality distorts how we see people. And so we're horrible at judging. And finally, when you take revenge, it actually doesn't solve the problem. In fact, it actually does the opposite. It fuels the problem. Because guess what? When you take revenge to somebody who's done you wrong, you start a vicious cycle going. So somebody did you wrong, you get back at them, they get back at you, you get back at them, they get back at you, and there's this vicious cycle of destruction that goes on. But listen, when we don't respond with revenge, that cycle stops. And that evil doesn't touch our lives because we, we stop. But we understand that we don't take revenge. When we do that, we're not actually letting that person off the hook. I think that's what keeps us from wanting to take revenge. We think we're letting that person off the hook. But we're simply trusting that God says that I'm a just God and I am the one that's going to repay. God is the one that's going to mete out his justice. In fact, listen closely. God's going to hold us all accountable for everything we've ever done. Look what it says in Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. I want you to realize this. Every sin that we've ever committed or anybody else has ever committed is going to be paid for. It's either going to be paid for by that person suffering in hell or it's already been paid for in Christ through his blood on the cross. Okay? And so we, that means that our vengeance isn't required. We can't add to the price. Our ability to let go of revenge is rooted in our trust that God is going to bring justice about. He's going to be the one. And Paul adds this as well. He says in verse 20, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And now, you know, some of us who have enemies, we're like, where can I get some of these coals <laughs> for my enemies? I really like that. It's funny, though, as I studied this passage and really tried to get to the heart of what it means when, when this is written, the saying is written that you, by doing good, you'll heap burning coals on their head. Um, everyone seems to have their own opinion on what this means. But everyone does agree at this. It doesn't mean to burn your your enemy's head. <laughs> it doesn't mean that at all. And so let me give you two views out there. One view is, is that there generally wasn't any matches, okay? Like people just didn't have, go to the store, pick up some matches so that they could light fires at their house. And so one of the ways that they would handle that is like if your neighbor had a fire going and they had some hot coals and you didn't have a fire going, you go ask them for some of their hot coals so that you could start your fire and, and get your fire going. Now, if your enemy comes up to you and asks you for that, and you're good enough to give them that, they would put it in a pot, or anybody would put it in a pot, but the enemy would put it in a pot and carry that on their head. 
to their house. And, and the Bible is basically saying, or, or one opinion is, is that the Bible is basically saying that person would then experience your goodness and probably feel guilty over it and repent and feel bad because you're being extremely generous to them and helping them out. Now, another viewpoint is, is that this is just kind of a Jewish saying that a metaphor that we either by doing this it will either wake that person up to injustice they're doing or it will increase the judgment that's on them and this is how they viewed it and it would be that basically the desire though and the motivation is that you desire them to actually to wake up and realize that they're harming you and that they hurt you and that they would repent but if they didn't the Jewish person believes that on the day of God's judgment, God would say that to that person, after all the kindness that has been shown you and you still treated them poorly, your judgment is going to be harsher. And we already know, Scripture declares, that some people will be judged harsher than others. I don't know how that works out in eternity, but we know that there are some people that are going to be judged harsher than others because of the truth they know. And that's how they believed it. And so I think the point of the matter is, is that our goal is to show them goodness and show them mercy, hoping that they see the goodness and they repent over that goodness and realize that they've done you wrong. And some of you have experienced that, right? You've been good to people who have done bad to you. And over a period of time, they've come to you and said, you know what, I was wrong about you. And I'm sorry. Because God's word works. Other times, they just get more and more angry with you and there's no resolving it. Listen, as we close out chapter 12, Paul basically sums up what he has been teaching our response to that evil person should be. And he says this in verse 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. That word conquer is a military term. And it means to overcome or overpower something or someone. Okay, And so whether you realize it or not, you and I are in a battle when it comes to the evil that is in this world and how people treat us. And there is a way to win that battle, but there's also a way to lose that battle. And one of the ways that you and I will lose that battle every time is when evil is done to us, we respond with evil. Okay, And every time we'll lose that battle. The only way to victory is to overcome evil with good. And this is why this passage is so important for the Christian is that we begin to step back and see the big picture and understand that God has called us to live differently. And it's not the common way. It's so uncommon to live this way. And, and we experience this and we grow in this. Now, I know we've, we've covered this story before, but I think there's a truth that we learn from Joseph's life. And, and how he responded. Remember Joseph? His brothers tried to literally destroy and ruin his life because he had a dream. And they didn't like it. And so they sold him into slavery. And they knew that selling him into slavery was probably the end for him. And their intention was to completely destroy and ruin his life. And yet Joseph didn't respond to his brothers the way that they deserved. We see this in Genesis 50, 20. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Listen, how did Joseph respond like this to his enemies, to his brothers? I mean, I want you to think about this. Joseph had the power to destroy his brothers. He actually could have, and yet he still didn't. Because his life was in the hands of God and he believed God was in control the whole way. And he trusted God with his life completely. And see, that's the key. When we begin to learn to trust God with our lives completely, we begin to realize that, guess what? God is using all of these circumstances for his glory. Ultimately, we must always remember that we live to bring glory to God. And so it's not about what people do to us that really matters. It's always about how you and I respond to what people do to us. See, we get all caught up into, into the moment-by-moment -moment things that happen to us, and we never step back and realize that God is allowing these things to shape and mold us. And that the greatest thing that we have to answer to is how we respond. You will never change what's being done to you, but you can always change how you respond to what's done to you. And God is going to hold us accountable in that. 
And he's already told us how we're to love even in the most unlovable circumstances. But listen, every time that we get this right, every time we shed light in the darkness and we shine light on the glory of God because it is evidence. We just sang that, right? I see the evidence. It's the evidence of the gospel and how it's really transformed our lives, that we are a new creation, that the old is gone, everything's new. And so this is so important and vital that how we respond to our enemies is way bigger of an issue than most of us realize. And yet, it is an opportunity to bring honor and glory to God in every single time. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I know, Lord, that in a lot of ways, we, we talk through many situations that we normally probably would just overlook and think, yeah, I've got that, I'm doing good. But Lord, as we peel back the layers, I think many times we, real we realize how hard it is to love those who wrong us, God. That it pops up even in little things. And Lord, yet it's an indication that there are areas of our lives that are still unredeemed and need to be touched by you, Jesus. And I thank you that, Lord, you have called us not to run away from those that, Lord, have done us wrong. But you've called us to really bring light into their darkness. And I pray that we would be able to step back and see the big picture. God, for some of us, Lord, it's really recognizing that there are people around us that when good happens, we're just not happy about it. And when bad things are happening to them, we, we do take joy in that, God. And Lord, may we repent of that because, Lord, may we truly understand that if they're receiving something good, Lord, it's from you. And if we resent that, we're resenting you, God. And so I thank you that your spirit will convict us and wake us up to treating people. Lord, not in light of how they deserve, but in light of the realization that we didn't get what we deserve, God. And so today we thank you for the incredible grace and mercy that you poured out on us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Judge is going to share a scripture with us. Amen. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 37 to 39 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Praise God. All throughout, all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. Yes. You lead. 
take my heart in victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. Yeah, I see evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. He's a good God. I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. See the cross, see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin was rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin is rolled away because of you. Jesus, oh, I see, I see the evidence of your good, he's a good God, all over my life, all over my life, I see your promises in fulfillment, all over my life, all over Why should I fear? Why should I fear? The evidence is here. Why should I fear? Oh, the evidence is here. I see it. I see the evidence of your good. All over my life, everywhere, Lord. All over my life. I see the promises in fulfillment. All over my life. Yes, Lord. All over my life. Yeah. I see the evidence of your goodness. All over my life. All over my life. Why should I fear, Lord? Why should I fear? The evidence is here. Thank you, Lord. Yes, it is near. Hallelujah. Your goodness, Lord, your goodness, mercy and goodness and favor shall follow us, Lord, all the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy and hallelujah to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt sing it now Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. 
kingdom to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our savior died let's thank him and the morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored let's praise him today whoa church and the church of christ was born when the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Oh, let's sing it with all our hearts today. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. He is God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Praise the Father. thanks today Jesus I thank you for the opportunity to come to the table God and Lord we come to the table recognizing our starting point Jesus is the incredible life changing power of the gospel at work in our lives that what you did for us God has completely changed and transformed us, God. And I just pray as we take communion today, we, we just are able to humbly realize that we never, never get far away from the cross. Where we could never do this life on our own, and so we're dependent upon you every step of the way, Jesus. So I pray that, Lord, as we take communion, we, we just recognize just how good you've been to us, Jesus. The Bible says, In the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And after the supper, he lifted up the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. It's the blood that's been shed for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. Jesus, we thank you for your blood and it's been poured out for us, God. And that we are changed by you and that we are a new creation. 
God, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that we would just grow in your grace and knowledge of you, God, and all that you've done for us. And we thank you for the reminder of the cross in our lives, God, this week. And we give you praise and we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand up, we'll dismiss this morning. I want to close with a blessing. But may the Lord bless you. May God keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you and grant you his peace. Amen and God bless.